we believe it's 50 years since George Formby passed away? I thought I'd mark the occasion by taking a couple of minutes to share with you my prized possession, George's uke. When George Formby passed away, he had about 20 ukuleles and ukulele banjos in his possession, some of which he hardly used, and others, about 10 of which I should say, were the tools of his trade, like this one. The particular claim to fame of this one is that he used it on his last ever recorded performance of a song, and it was leaning on a lamppost. I'm leaning on a lamppost at the corner of the street. His first Gibson was one like this, a UB2 model, also often described as a baby Gibson because it doesn't have the big resonator that you see on the UB3, 4 and 5. Uh, he used one of these in his earliest films, and later in the 30s there are pictures of him with the UB3 model. At some time, George's baby Gibson got damaged. Uh, I'm guessing that happened in the war years. Only guessing, of course, but uh, it would seem likely, given the conditions George was working in. Certainly, there aren't any pictures of him using that first UB2 after the war. It's in 1947 that the first dateable pictures of him appear using this uke. So it's my guess that he bought it then. It seems that he bought two of these, and also a new UB2, with the dots on the fingerboard like this, instead of the diamond shaped cutouts. I guess uh, that after six years of war, and not being able to get hold of anything, that was quite a natural thing to do at that time. These pictures are from George's personal photograph album, taken in September 1947 on his tour of Australia. And uh, it's interesting to note that he travelled to Australia via America. It's possible that he might have picked up his Gibsons there. Certainly it would have been easier to get Gibsons in America than it would over here. In fact, that was true right up until the invention of eBay. Anyway, the pictures prove that he was very fond of the uke and used it a lot on his travels, particularly his international tours after the war. There's a picture here of him using it in Sweden. You can see from the state of the vellum that he obviously played it a lot. I've got the original vellum here, actually. There it is. George's original vellum with his finger marks on it. I've got his strings in here as well. George's original strings that he played. Uh, in fact, this is his case. Just a cardboard case. I don't keep it in that. I've got a much stronger one. But then I suppose it's probably more precious to me than it was to him. Uh, he must have cared a little bit about it, though, because he did wrap it in cotton wool. <laughs> and there it is. A little bit of it. Um, I've got a fiberglass case for it. Like this. Oh! By the way, that's one of George's ties there, given to me by a pal of mine, John. Thanks, John. I must stop doing that. Well, it's great that there's a lot of photograph and film evidence of George using this youth. And in December 1960, just three months before he died, he recorded a film of his life story and he used this uke for four of the songs and of course that was his last performance on film. The only film of him after that I think was a press conference when he announced his engagement to Pat Harrison but just three weeks after that he was gone. The controversy over his will resulted in all his possessions being auctioned off. Well at the auction it was bought by Bill Logan, a stalwart of the George Formby Society and he kept it for 31 years until 1992 when it was bought by Les Moore. Well, Les had always been a George Formby fan and always wanted to own something belonging to his hero. Bill sold the Gibson to Les and Les, along with his wife Pat, came to the George Formby Society, which is where I met them. I was about 12 or 13 at the time, just starting to do little gigs of my own. Les took a liking to me and said that I could borrow the uke any time I liked, which I promptly did. I made some recordings of George's songs with it, and it was it's such a thrill to be playing the same strings that my hero had strummed. Well, I used the uke many times, and we became firm friends with Les and Pat, and when the decision was made to restore the uke to its former glory, it was agreed that my dad, Walt, should do the renovation work to preserve the instrument for future generations. All the metal work was replated, uh, a new vellum and strings were put on for playability but the woodwork was left as it was because all these scratches here were made by George himself so we didn't touch those. On the vellum George had written lamp post and low to remind him what key the ute was in what song he was playing on it. He always did that because he had all his instruments in different keys so that was his reminder. Uh, so on the replacement vellum we got his brother Ted 
to write log and lamppost and his handwriting is exactly the same. So now that Ted's gone, that's a nice memento of him as well. When Les died, his wife Pat decided that I should have the honour of taking care of this instrument. Uh, not just because we were friends, but because she knew I would look after it and use it as well, which I do. Uh, it's been featured on every CD I've made in my professional career, and that's a tradition I'll continue if I possibly can. I don't take it on the road with me, but I do bring it out for special occasions, and Thornby fans are always delighted to see it and have a picture taken with it. Well, there it is, my prized possession. George may be gone, but his songs still sound as good as they ever did, and everyone who picks up a uke is still gobsmacked, as they say in Lancashire, by what he did with one of these. Hang leaning on a lamppost at the corner 